everybody in TV land. Love it. Where's uh, where, Wow, sure. I'm here today. How'd it go? Um, well, I apparently had to get two MRIs instead of one, but I didn't know that. But I was, I took, I got to take Valium, so I was well, just on the cloud. Um, <laughs> I don't even know what I'm doing. Um, and the MRIs were here, which sucks, and I don't know why my things are hurting. So I had to get more some shots in both, and I had a total of five shots all together. Just yeah. shots. Yeah, and it hurts like my back special, and I don't know what to do. Yeah, what about shots? Yeah, so if the shots help me for the next month, then that means that there's something physically wrong. But if it doesn't, then it could be related to mental health. Because I have social anxiety, and a lot the doctor was like, it could be a lot of people with depression and anxiety hold their tension in places. No, it's not like that. So either way, well, hopefully we'll know in a month. I mean, it'd be nice just to know. Yeah. Uh, yeah, come on. Do me a solid. Let's go. There we go. Well played. Great at catching. Well, uh, I'm just that good. I can go pro. The old bike, you don't go? I like the old bike. Yeah. No, no, no. Two minutes. Two Should we do the test today? No. Is that a yes? Well played. Oh, it's hard as I can throw it. Yes. There's no one ever here. I love being far away from people. Far away from people. Okay, here we go. Before we talk about the test, did you see that? I'm getting good at that. Oh, yeah, the stocks are out, people. So, oh, we're tardy. By the way, yes, the head and our holes are kind of small. We have ways of making you fit. Go. I already did it. You got in this? Yeah. Mistakes are made. Mistakes are made. By the way, they're shocking me on top of it. So, the next time anyone comes and looks at our class, let's just pick some student at random and start everyone chanting stocks. <laughs> just stocks, stocks, stocks. Yeah. Did that fit? It's, uh, the net hole is pretty small. The, the guy who made it literally had his growth spur. He made it right after he made it. Yeah. Okay, we have a test tomorrow. What are you going to bring tomorrow? What three things? Notes. Notes. Computer. Bribe. Just come in, drop all your valuables and bribes in the call room because I want to be purely impartial. I gave you this pass on Monday. What did you think I said? Bribe. Well, you know what? We talked about this cult like thing called Church Universal where they have, they basically just bring 
husband and uh, brides and grooms together. They meet and get married all in one. Like literally in about five minutes they meet and they have mass weddings of like 20,000. Yeah, they have them in stadiums all over the United States and Korea. We, we won't do that. That's a separate story. Uh -oh. Okay, so with this test, uh, I'm, I'll have 25 questions done. You want more or less? I might add one more, but I might take one. I'll, 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 it'll be around 25. How long do you have? 25 minutes. So as soon as you sit down, get the computer going, I will have it on Teams. I'll be, it'll be an assignment on Teams. Go. Sound good? And when you're done, I I think I might get that map tomorrow. Are you going to be here tomorrow? I might do it tomorrow. I, would, I forgot about the steps. People might be done earlier. So you're done. Huh? Let's relax for once in class. Say it again. Let's relax for once in class. He never quits. He loves it. He loves You see anywhere. Look, is there an off switch? <laughs> someday. Someday I'm just going to. Yeah. So, see about five years. Okay. So let's go and finish War of 1812. What do you say? Any questions about review list? I put copies of our teams, but I've given, given it to you. And it's going to be very basic. Who is that? I'll save it. It's more fun as a surprise. And where is he looking? In your soul. Now that's a great picture. That's one of the more famous ones. I will decide if we're going to have our dress update for uh, extra credit in December, but we all know what your choice would be. Neck hair! What battle was the Compton's Confederacy defeated? Tippy Canoe. Yeah, who defeated them? Who is the general territorial governor of Indiana? Yeah, William Henry Harrison. And it was during the presidency of Benjamin Harrison who named it after his grandson. So yeah. Hmm? It's from Indiana. Fort Harrison named after him during the presidency of his grandson. And Oh, what did citizens of the United States start calling themselves? Americans. And what threat was gone to the expansion of the United States? Indian. Yeah, the American Indian threat. Do the indigenous people have no chance? Now, they're still very far with southern tribes, but the United States is going to wipe them out too. And literally, the rest is going to be a horrific last day. Just trapped. Um, oh! Who does the United States blame for who? The British, of course. And oh, he was one along with Henry Clay. What do we call those pro war Southern and Western congressmen? Oh. Yeah, the War Hawks. So let's go ahead and then get, let's do the war. So, my that picture. So, Madison did not want war, but 1812, after what happened in Indiana Territory, Congress would declare war, and President Madison reluctantly signed it. Now, you do not need to know the exact numbers. The House was pretty much for war, but the Senate, especially Northeastern senators, voted against it. So this was not a unanimous war. There were a lot of people, especially in the Northeast, opposed to the war. And there's three basic reasons for the war. Neutrality rights. That's rights on the high seas. Security along the frontier, so the threat to expansion, and the United States wants land, aka Canada. During the Revolutionary War, the United States, or the actually the pre-U.S. the Continental Army tried to invade Canada and failed miserably. But the assumption was they could cross into Canada and the Canadians would rebel and join the United States. Land, land, land. But most of the merchants who were involved in shipping 
They were in the northeast, and that section was opposed to the war. This whole thing about neutrality rights most affected the shippers in the northeast. These are the two biggest reasons for the war. Ryder, these two. So, war is declared. This is the Battle of Put-in Bay on Lake Erie. Soon, this war is going to be dubbed Mr. Madison's War, which is ironic because he didn't really want the war, but he signed the bill. Just as John Adams didn't necessarily want the Alien and Sedition Act, but it became his law because he signed it. So first off, there's no Federalist support. Federalist New England not only opposed, but they talked secession. The country was not divided. Now, you don't need the number. Just put the military was not prepared. But I put the numbers to give you an idea how small the U.S. Army was. 6,700 men in the regular army, which is minuscule. We just need to know the army is small. Eventually, 35,000 mostly militia, but the U.S. Army was tiny compared to the British Army. The British Army wasn't even that big compared to, let's say, the French Army. The U.S. had 16 ships in its Navy, and only seven were floating. None of them were shipped of the line, the big battleships. The British had 200 plus ships of the line, let alone a thousand other ships. It's not even close. This is insanity, except for one thing. What is, what is most of the Royal Navy doing at this time, or for that matter, the British Army? Yeah, they're fighting the French. Actually, the big place where the British Army is, they're in Iberia. Back to stopping them. So with that, so the U.S. is not prepared, but they figure they're fighting what is now Spain. Okay, remember the Bank of the United States? It did pass back in 1892, but it only had a 20-year charter. And that charter expired in 1812. Madison was one of the opponents. Republicans were opposed to the bank, and the bank died. This led to a financial disaster. All of a sudden, the money situation fell apart, and the economy, which is already in tatters, because remember the Embargo Act, Macon's Bill Number 2, the Non-Intercourse Act, because of those laws, and nothing to control the money supply, economic ruin. So just at a time, we got to spend money because we're at war. I should add, ironically, in 19 or in 1816, the bank would come back, and James Madison would sign the bill bringing the bank back. They realized we need something to control the money supply, even though the bank was imperfect. Yeah. Just a dumb question. Do they have? I can't remember. Do they have a set currency that they count? Like how they have dollars, or like the they? Yes, but don't think of it like today. Okay. Yeah. So then once the bank. Was that just kind of all yeah. So it kind of went to basically banks started issuing their own currency. States could banks issue banks issue currency all the time to the state. Check. And they have all and then you people started trading bonds. It, everything just kind of fell apart. And nobody would trust the old previous dollar, so paper currency wasn't worth as much as gold. It just our currency, what we think of today, where you know a dollar means a dollar, that still was not quite there until 1913, which is really not that long ago. So, with that, Madison would be reelected. Madison would be reelected. And I gotta do something really quick. But you notice the Northeast. The Northeast voted for the Federalists. So the country is very divided over this. But the West and the South, all for the war. So the plan was this. The U.S. was going to invade Canada. It has a tiny army. And it's really hard to move the soldiers around. Most of the U.S. Army was still here or down here. There's no roads, only by river, 
And the British fleet, even though most of it's fighting the French, the British fleet can still stop any American effort. They're, they're partially blockading the United States. So the plan was, they'll invade here, here, and here. How did it go in 1812-1813? Disaster. Horrible disaster. Unbelievably humiliating disaster for the United States. All three efforts failed. Beyond belief. At Niagara, the U.S. Army faced, was totally defeated, and the New York militia would not be committed by their governor, and they literally sat on a hilltop watching the battle from a mile away. That shows you how divided the country was. At Detroit, General Hall, who was literally a fossil from the Revolutionary War, um, could barely mount his horse anymore because he was so infirm, he would surrender over 3,500 men to a force of less than 1,500 men. Half of them were Tecumseh's, remnants of Tecumseh's Confederacy. In fact, this is one of the more humiliating defeats in American history. Hall, sitting in Fort Detroit, just took, um, a well-defended fort with ramparts, a, a star fort, didn't have to surrender. Yet he saw the British out in front of him, panicked, because this is what the British did. Think about maybe 700 British soldiers, maybe 700 uh, allies of Tecumseh. And about a mile away, so about a mile and a half away, so in sight, the British marched in front of Fort Detroit. So they marched out of the forest into a clearing and then back into the forest, followed by Tecumseh's men. And what did the first British soldiers do when they got out of the out of the clearing into the forest? They sprinted around and ran again. And they did that about five times. All thought he was outnumbered and surrendered without firing a shot. We're in rough shape. Barely making it. Okay, the army would be reorganized. Uh, there would be at least holding their own here and here. There'd even be a raid into York, but it was a disaster. The U.S. did not win at all. Fortunately, just at this time were the last major battles of, of the Napoleonic Wars after its defeat in Russia. So that's only that saved the United States. And Britain desperately won it out of this thing. Britain has been fighting forever, it seems like. And so with that, right here on Lake Erie, there'd be one battle where a makeshift U.S. fleet called the Battle of Lake Erie or put in Bay. The U.S. won a victory here. General Je or Admiral Oliver Hazard Commodore Oliver Hazard Perry would be kind of a makeshift uh, fleet. They would just whatever ships they could grab and put guns on it. Defeated here. Uh, I won't talk about. Don't give up the ship. That's another story. But he sent word back to Washington D.C. that the United States fleet had won. It's relatively minor victory, but we won something on Lake Erie. And with this great comment. I always like this one. We've met the enemy and they are ours. That's a good one. You probably heard that before. That came from Perry at this battle. There'd be a raid later on in October of 1813 into Canada where they would burn down the colonial capital at York. It's called Toronto today. But that would culminate in the Battle of the Thames, right about here. And that small British force met. A U.S. force now better trained under William Henry Harrison, so better led. This was just a raid, though. This was not an invasion. Just looking for something the U.S. could say we want. Well, the British abandoned the field and left it to Tecumseh and his remnants, and they were overwhelmed and defeated. And so this battle, along with Tippecanoe, would make Harrison, and Tecumseh would be killed. We don't know what happened to the body, but he died. And let me get through everything in about time. I'll tell you the story about what happened here. But one of the few victories, this lithographs became a big deal. And so that is supposedly the death of Tecumseh. We don't know what happened. Children would look for years for his body because the story was that, his, that when Tecumseh died, he would turn to Flint. But remember how much they feared Tecumseh. And so... This was a huge deal for the United States. Now we can take everything. So in 1814, though, Napoleon is defeated. And Britain has decided 
one sharp campaign and will knock the United States out. We might even be able to divide it up and take a few areas. This is going to slap the United States down. And this could have been a nightmare, except for a couple lucky events happened for the United States. First off, a blockade. They were doing the blockade before, but now this blockade is going to be a complete blockade. Because they have ships fresh from uh, blockade duty against the French, those four sailors, now they had to go right over to the United States, and they sat right off all the major harbors. Next, a massive invasion at Lake Champlain. This should sound familiar. Remember General Burgoyne in the Battle of Saratoga? But this time, it's so, it's so what? It just interrupts how things flip around. Back in 1777, the British were going to cut this off because that's where the Patriots are. Now their plan is to go all the way down to New York City and cut off New England so it will break away from the United States. That's their plan. So they're going to go all the way down to Hudson and hopefully New England would secede. Who knows what would happen? And that was the hotbed of anti-British activity just 40 years earlier. Next, go up to Chesapeake and raid Washington, D.C. Remember what I told you, the United States raided and burnt down the, the uh, Canadian colonial capital. And lastly, attack New Orleans. Take it. And if they go to treaty and they're sitting there with British soldiers in New Orleans, their plan was to keep it. We're staying there. And this, another one of those what ifs. What if they would have taken it? Who knows how history would be different? Yeah. British. Yeah, British one. British one. Yep, the British one. And the thing was, got to wait till summer. So this is going to be late summer. Here, remember August through October, that's hurricane season down here. So they got to wait until November, December here for New Orleans. So that's the plan. But Britain wants out of the plan. They're doing this, but ideally for Britain, okay, we'll knock the Americans out unless we just come up with a peace agreement and solve it. The Americans are just barely holding on. And most of the American army now better trained are here and here or down here. So that has a chance. But at the Battle of Lake Champlain, the British had to take Lake Champlain with their supplies. They needed to get supplies down to the Hudson River and then down to New York City. There were virtually no American troops then. A few in the fort, remember Ticonderoga. 16 American ships, so small ship sloops they made, on, literally made there on Lake Champlain, shockingly defeated a British fleet about the same size. Relatively evenly gunned, but great tactics by Captain McDonnell. And the Americans won this victory. If a few things would have been different, heck, if the current, if the current would have changed during the battle, the British might have won. And if the British would have won on Lake Champlain, there would have been nothing to stop their 10,000 troops marching in New York City. But when they couldn't take Lake Champlain right away, they knew it would be too late in the season to go to New York City, so they pulled back. Remember, they weren't too, you know, it's kind of like, yes, we want to do it, but we would like this war to be over. Yeah. Well, then that succeeded. And it's kind of like, let's make a fleet. Okay, then they just made a fleet. But the Chesapeake campaign was a little bit different. This is in August and September of 1814. So they sailed up to Chesapeake, and their plan was raid Washington, D.C., which was, remember, there's not much there yet, but the capital's there. The executive mansions there, and then raid and destroy the harbor at Boston or Baltimore. Baltimore was just becoming a major port. So, an experienced admiral, Admiral Cochran, who lead the Royal Navy. Our general Ross was this very experienced British general. They had over 5,000 crack British troops who had been fighting in Spain and France. Very experienced. 
hurt. They're not real happy because they've been fighting in Spain and in France for, for eight years, and now they got to go to here. And they have a good plan. The Navy would sail up the Potomac, threaten this way, but the main force of soldiers would land overland and attack over the land. It's a good plan. And it nearly worked. The few regular troops that were in Washington, D.C. went down here. That meant there were only about 8,000 untrained militia here at a place called Bladensburg. Now, remember, the U.S. has more troops now. They're getting better troops, better generals like Winfield Scott. Scott's here. There are no roads. So it's going to take months to get here on just basically, basically wagon running trails. So they're stuck. But Bladensburg is a good place. They have to march through the town, and at the end of the town, closer to Washington, D.C., there are two stone walls this high on either side of the road that stretch for a couple miles. Perfect for it, isn't it? Men behind the stone wall go to a here, so the breastwork. What do militia always do? They run, don't they? But now they got a wall. And the thought was, if they're behind this wall, they don't need to hold on. This is just a raid. The British are going to try to take it quick, cause a lot of damage, and then leave. Hold out for a couple days, Washington, D.C. can survive. That's a victory. In fact, the Americans were so confident at Bladensburg that uh, Madison rode out to watch the battle, to watch the fun from a hill nearby. So he's on horseback, same with Secretary of State Madison. They went down to watch the battle. So they're watching it by horseback. And they assume we're going to stop them. We outnumber the British, and they know the British are going to do something really quick, and they don't realize they think there's fewer British soldiers than what they were. So from this easy-to-follow map, you can see exactly what happened. Do I need really to explain? So they swept through this wall. They got here, and the British plan was, Ross had his men march to about 50 paces. This should sound familiar, just like what happened at Guilford Courthouse. And fire and then charge. Bigger than the Americans would run. And he's in a hurry. So they got the 50 yards. They lay, uh, got ready to fire. And the American plan, take the first shot, stand up and fire. By the way, I'm saying Americans, they still really didn't call themselves quite Americans yet. That's coming. But the militia got behind the wall for the first shot, stood up, saw the British soldiers coming through it. Now, fixed bayonets were marching at full speed. And what did they do? Very carefully detained and ran. All of them ran. They just all took off running. In fact, they would call it the Bladensburg races because the British couldn't catch it. They ran all the way to Washington, D.C., and men just kept running. The British followed right afterwards. Madison's like, ah, he took off, rode back as fast as they could. They barely had enough time to get their families and a few things out of their homes and take off. If you go to D.C., there are plaques at the spot where Madison watched British soldiers enter the Capitol and into the executive mansion before he ran away. That's how humiliating this was. A total disaster. The British came in, and what did they do? Lots of looting and lots of burning. I love this picture when they got to D.C. So here they are. Taking out uh, plaques and various things for the front of the cap or for the capital or, or the executive mansion with the I said this capital with the executive mansion burning. I like this one. You see them British soldiers marching and you know stuff on their back. That's all the loot they stole. And now they're going back. And so when they got to the White House and burned it down, wasn't called the White House yet, but there were a couple shots fired. And this is what it looked like afterwards. The shell remained, but the entire inside was gutted. So they basically kept the shell and rebuilt the entire inside. They rebuilt it again in 1947-48. So the White House today, they, they gutted the whole thing again in 47. They just kept the shell. So it's not, it's not the same. The White House today is not the same as, let's say, Lincoln or FDR or whoever was there. But... And these columns out in front, they always they like to show these a lot. They're still the same columns. And there are bullet holes in them to this day, musket holes. 
to take a tour, and you walk out that front door, which is, I've been to tour twice, and both of them walk out that door. I don't know if they still do it. That was about 20 years ago, last time I did it. But um, you stand there and look over to the left, they're full of them. They're not so nice. Don't think, try to take a picture. You see that service does not like that. Yes. What did they say? Well, I thought they don't want you taking pictures in the White House. Okay, that's fine, but I'm, I'm outside of it. So I thought I'll take a picture. I thought it'd be a good picture. And I got my camera out. And I, of course, didn't want to. <laughs> Took it out. And there's Secret Service agents all over. And it's so amazing because they're mostly in dark suits. And you figure you would see them, but no, they like blend into, they're just everywhere. And yet they're not really wearing camouflage. And I'm like this, and I turn, and there's a guy standing right there. And he just goes, and I go, <laughs> Got me. So, then they went up to the Capitol, and they just went and looted, broke, anything that was valuable they stole, everything else, what did they do? They, at first they broke, then we're going to burn. So imagine the house chambers. I bought a room about the size of my room and Mr. Foucault's room at that time. It was relatively small. And they're just breaking stuff and doing everything. And General Ross is like, all right, got to get going. And he's trying, he and the, his officers are trying to get to the attention of the man who are just having a blast. And he finally starts beating his pistol on the speaker of the U.S. House of Representatives podium. He's beating his pistol, not working. Finally shoots. And they, well, they, huh? And he goes, man, this is a parliament. So we'll have a vote. Shall we burn it? Like, ah! So they burnt it. This, and so if you go there today, the basement of the U.S. Capitol, Capitol today, it's on the foundations of the old Capitol, and there's still scorch marks in that old foundation. So, humiliation. But they pulled out, and now they're going to Baltimore. Baltimore is a much bigger town. Same basic plan. Use the fleet to threaten and have a diversion here, go into the harbor area, but then march overland. And just a quick raid, basically burn down the harbor, get out. That was the plan. But there's a fort, a few forts built, but a fort right here that's half partially finished called Fort McHenry. So they're going to knock that fort out, that allow the Navy to come in. They could take Baltimore and then pull them out. So they want to reduce that fort. It's partially finished. So, on the night of the 13th and 14th, that's the plan to knock out Fort McHenry. So that's what Fort McHenry looks like today. It's a national park today, so it's a star fort, then masonry buildings inside. If you ever get a chance, go there. It's really cool. Beautiful harbor. Just a really neat area right outside of Baltimore. And it's unfinished for it. See these walls right here? See those? Those are called ramparts. And, but it's not finished. And so there's not, no one really thought they could hold out. They bought 100 men that were in the fort. So the British plan was to knock it out. So they didn't want to bring their big ships in, so they used these smaller vessels with mortars. You know what a mortar is? Yeah. Instead of most cannon have a relatively flat trajectory, this one's very high. The roofs are not as well or as heavily uh, armed. So go through the roofs of the bit. So mortar is high trajectory. Not very long range, but very high. Mortar boats. They're going to sail on fire mortars. By the way, what's a mortar? Sometimes called a bomb. Sometimes it be a full cannonball. But sometimes they can take the cannonball and drill a hole into it and fill it with gunpowder. Still not very explosive, because this is still pretty high explosives. But then they have a long fuse. And the whole plan was, when they fired the cannonball, the fuse would light. And they hopefully could time the fuse, so when it landed, it would explode. And these move really slow, it's black powder. So you can see the fuse in the sky at night. So it, has, it must be pretty spectacular. You can see the trajectory. Now, sometimes the fuse might go really early and explode in the cannon. 
That's bad for crew and water. Or it's below the middle of the air. They also have these rockets. And the rockets, um, not, they're not guided. Have you ever seen a bottle rocket? Stick, imagine like a stick about 12 feet long with a barrel of gunpowder on it. And they put in this little kind of two pieces of wood to make like a diagonal and they kind of set it on a physical. I like that. And they kind of pop in the air. They don't really hit anything. Sometimes they might land on something, the ground. But they look spectacular at night. So the plan was reduce the fort. How do we know the fort's reduced? They take the fly down under this room. That's the plan. Well, in some of the fighting north of town, and actually it involves the return of a slave that joined the British. The British were recruiting slaves to fight against the Americans and offering their freedom. Does this sound familiar? Just like the American Revolution. A man by the name of Francis Scott Key went out to get the release of his friend, Dr. B. All you need to know is that it's Francis Scott Key. And he was on this ship called the Tonic. He went out there and asked for the release. And they said, well, we'll talk about it later. We're about ready to shell for McHenry. So he stuck on board this boat. So he had a front row seat of watching the shelling of Fort McHenry. And so to get to release, Beans uh, either lost a slave or a slave was killed in the process and want the British to pay them back. We're not in the most noble purposes right there, but that's why Key went out there. So he watched this. And so his last sight was the very large flag, the massive flag that was flying over Fort McHenry. And the assumption was in the morning it won't be there because they'd surrender. And in fact, the, the, think about all those shells and rockets at night. It must have just been awe-inspiring. Like, there's no way they could survive that. By the way, here's the flag. This is years afterwards. The flag would be many feet longer, but uh, people cut off pieces of it for souvenirs, including cut out one of the stars for a souvenir. So the flag that remains is much shorter. And this also, I've had this one because the guy gives you an idea of the scale of this flag. It's about five stories high. It's a massive, massive flag. Huh? Um, getting, um, weaving the cloth in very long strips and then sewing them together. And so that's the flag he saw. So the night after the long bombardment, what did Key see? The flag was still standing. The bombardment basically missed. The men in their half-finished bombproofs, shelters, survived. And in response, he would write a poem, four stanzas, called The Defense of Fort McHenry. But everybody today calls it the Star-Spangled Banner. Here is a reenactment of it using fireworks. I saw a little bit of one, they just fired a couple. It was, it was pretty cool, I gotta say. But the flag is now at the Smithsonian Museum of, of American History. And it had, um, what, 23 years ago? Get my years right. They reconditioned it stitch, stitch by stitch. So the flag is now um, pretty vibrant. It's in an environment, environment mentally protected Areas so you have to go through this whole elaborate thing to go see it now. Um, this is the flag that hangs when you enter the Smithsonian. And this gives you an idea of how much was cut off. That's the old. So you, have a, so you can get an idea when you're walking. When I first went, it was the original flag. And it, it was pretty bright. Now it's pretty remarkable, and I'm glad they have it preserved. But this would become pretty popular after the war because. When McHenry held, the British decided it's not worth taking Baltimore and they retreated. Baltimore survived. Did the U.S. win? Eh, but we called it a victory. We won the British flag. They just burnt their capital. I don't care. And so this would become pretty popular. This would become very popular. And a couple things about it. First off, he had a song in mind. When he wrote this, he had a song, a song in mind when he wrote it. So it has this beat, it had 
the, the meter is related to a salt. And so that's why it, uh, pretty soon people are singing this. But it's all fairly well known. But if you look at that, it has a meter and it kind of has a beat to it, the way you wrote it. But look at that first verse. Most people will know the first stanza or verse. Sun going down. There's the flag. There's the defenses, the ramparts, the rockets, the bombs. Gave proof through the night. The flight was still there and survived. Now, a couple things about it. It's a good fighting song. I mean, this is one warlike song. Now, it's not as warlike as the French national anthem. The Marseillaise literally has blood flowing in the streets. That is one violent song, but it's pretty darn violent. And now, if you try to sing this well, it's incredibly hard to sing, right? Have you ever tried to sing it well? I mean, okay, you can sing it poorly and you're perfectly fine. I can sing lots of songs poorly, but to sing it well, it's hard because you go low to high. Why? Because the song he based it on was meant to be rah, 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 and then screamed because it's a drinking song. It's from the Anacreon Society, and the song is to Anacreon in heaven. And it was meant to be sung for the Anacreon Society, which is basically a drinking society. So imagine a bunch of people passing around drinks, sitting around a piano, and a rah, 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 rah. The irony of ironies, that's the national anthem. And that's why it's so hard to say, because it's not meant to be sung well. Pretty funny, and yes, the Anacreon Society started in what country? Britain. Of course. Now, um, here's the whole poem. Here's the Anacreon, to Anacreon in heaven, to Anacreon in heaven, where, where he fast in full glee. Yeah, that's almost exactly the same. <laughs> to Anacreon in heaven, where he fast in full glee. Oh, say can you say can you say? Okay. 1916, though, during World War I, the decision was made that we better have a song. There was no national anthem yet. There were about four songs that Americans would use. Most, the most popular one was My Country Is a Thee. The problem with that song was it's the same music as God Save the King, the British national anthem. And so they decided on this one in 1931. This became the national anthem. During World War II and 40, especially 43, uh, national uh, Professional teams are still playing now, but kind of with athletes that could not be drafted. Baseball started playing this in front of the games. And that tradition stayed for the most part for the 1960s. It became kind of now just like the norm to play before games as part of kind of a pro war and then pro cold war patriotism. And yes, there are some objections to a such a warlike violent song. I should add one more thing. This song, this song also shows the very complex nature of the war, but also reflects Francis Scott Key's trip to the Taunton. This verse right here, the third stanza, it's that. Okay, first part. Traffic of war, about division, and contribution in the war. Their blood has washed out the foul foot so it's pollution. Okay, that's kind of hard to follow. The refuge could save the hireling, no refuge could save, could save the hireling and slave from the terror of flight or the doom of the grave. All those slaves that joined the British, you will get yours. So this shows the very complex history of the United States pretty well, doesn't it? That's in the National Anthem. And all four stanzas are part of the U.S. National Anthem. So yes, there's a very complex history of the country, and part B to that, Fort McHenry during the Civil War would become a Union prison. You know, you have a prison where they put Confederates who are suspected of uh, rebellion. One of those people put in was the great-grandson of Francis Scott Key, who was a Confederate. So, 
Once again, we have a complex history, doesn't it? You want to know why things are the way they are? We look to the past. Yes. No, I just say everyone. People have um, small memories, only remember one verse. I only remember one verse. But this is all the national anthem. But we only say one verse. By the way, what happened to those Ameri those uh, those people? Americans, because almost all were born in the in the, the, the in the United States, who joined the British Army, they would be in the Bahamas. And to this day, their descendants are called the Americans. Americans. And there were there were former slaves who won their freedom, but they couldn't go back to the United States, so they went to the Bahamas. And this is their settlement, that's one of the homes, a grave of some of the first Americans. That's why when people say America and kind of talk about the way people talk today, I'm, I think, oh, these are the Americans right here. And while this is going on, nobody wanted this stupid war anymore. And that is going to lead to the Treaty of Ghent. They're already negotiating this as the British are leaving Baltimore. They want this war over. They can't go to Paris because Napoleon, they just surrendered. And so this Ghent is in now present day Belgium. Really pretty town. I'd walk this thing. Good story, right? Well, this is a status quo anti-bellum truth. Do you remember what that meant? I told you this once before. Say it again. Yeah. So back to where it was before the war. Yeah. Like the war didn't happen. What the heck was this war for? It would be signed on December 24th, 1814. By the way, you think, wow, Christmas Eve, and they were, remember, Christmas was not an important holiday. That's coming for anyone. Wait to the Industrial Revolution. That will change. So, while this is going on, same time, up in Hartford, Connecticut, Federalists were meeting, 26 New England Federalists, and they talked about nullification of the war or even secession. Fortunately, the war ended before that could happen, but it made the Federalists look unpatriotic after the war. Got that on? It made it look very un unpatriotic. Here is a Republican platform, and this is supposed to be Lady Columbia and a very creepy looking eagle. And that's the Republican. They stand for you know, the rights of the people. And here's the Federalist, the elves above. I kind of miss the hairy, hairy uh, Satanic picture, but you know, as it were, Satanic would not even use at that time. And the Federalist Party's on its last legs. One, two more things. The Creek War. So, while this is going on, the U.S. considered this part of the War of 1812. The Parkle Creek and Choctaw tribes, the U.S. now is going to have a campaign against them, claiming the British are helping them, just like up here. These are the people that could come to try to get in this Confederacy. The United States sent some trained forces, but an incredibly competent, intelligent lawyer from Nashville would lead them. He also had a, had a uh, volcanic temper, and as a very deservedly so mixed rea mixed reputation, Andrew Jackson. And his plan was to try to isolate the Creeks and knock them out. And that would happen at the horrific Battle of Horseshoe Bend. A seesaw battle, that's the diorama for the battle. Jackson's forces would eventually win a victory and the Creek would flee the battlefield. But Jackson's untrained militia, against orders from Jackson, would massacre a couple thousand Creeks as they ran away. And Jackson did not order it, was furious, but he without a doubt deserves the blame. Because he was the man in charge. And so this will be a real taint on the reputation of the United States and of course Andrew Jackson. 
but most Americans would have thought he was a hero for this. And after this, that would pretty much come out with Tippi Canoe and any champ, but it's all, yeah. Yeah, yeah, they're one of the tribes of the Southeast. And that would lead to the last battle, the Battle of New Orleans. Because remember, the British, they weren't going to sail up till winter. They didn't know the war had ended, and neither did Jackson. There was no way to tell them in 1814, 1815. They, in fact, began landing when the treaty was being signed. They had no idea. So Jackson, his regular soldiers, militia, and about 3,000 pirates, lots of pirates in New Orleans, they would meet a British army under General Edward Packenham. Yes, that's a great name. Now, I don't have time to go through all the issues of this battle. Remind me tomorrow, I got to tell you a couple stories. But the battle on January 8, 1815, would be a shocking and decisive victory for the United States and Andrew Jackson. In one hour, you don't need to know the numbers, just look. Just look at how uneven it was. The British attacked across open sugar plantation fields and were mowed down. It was a slaughter, including Pakenham. Pakenham was killed too. Jackson will come out of this a major hero. Think about what the United States felt after this war. Think about it for a second. We lost, barely survived. Our capital burned down. But the last battle, who won? So we won. We won. It's our, it's our victory. The United States is great. And this is going to begin a new wave of nationalism. And nationalism means intense pride or love of your, love of your country. And what's the reason for that? This is a brand new phenomenon this time. You love your country, why? Say, well, but why is it better than everyone else? Because it's our country. We love our country because it's our country. Therefore, we love our country because it's our country. Not for what it stands for, but we love it. And that's going to come out of this. And here's a couple things. What came out of this war? Just real fast. I know the bell is about ready to rain, but bear with me. What came out of it? We are now established as Americans, aren't we? And we're independent. Knowing that last, no threat to any, uh, any threat to American expansion. We're independent. And end of the Federals. Don't worry about the transportation revolution. Get the Industrial Revolution. That British blockade would trigger the Industrial Revolution. I know the bell is already ringing. I just want to get back. We survived. Remind me tomorrow. I have to tell. I'll tell you a couple stories. Sound good? After the test. Is everyone happy with that? And I know I went bell but I always go bell to bell. Remember what I told you. There's no what. Don't forget, what do you bring in tomorrow? Computer notes and rhyme. Okay. See you tomorrow. Why? Why? Oh, yeah, of course. <laughs> You were right. I didn't confuse because I know it's during the time of Benjamin Harrison, so I just thought it was named after Harrison. But yeah, you're right. Yes.
the wing. On the wing. the Kit Kats when you come in? Okay. Into the cauldron. Yeah. Because I'm fair and impartial. I feel like you're like 
Let me get out of this. We've recorded that.